Hello, Monetization Nation. Today I attended day two of Funnel Hacking Live 2021. As I told you yesterday, this is my favorite digital marketing conference of the year. And today did not disappoint. Today was a great day. I learned so much and I'm excited to share my key takeaways with you. The day started off with a speaker named Trent Shelton. Trent is a former NFL player. He has more than 10 million followers and more than a billion video views. He feels that application creates transformation. He says that we live in a society where people try to fake it. He said, your transparency will lead to your transformation. We should ask ourselves, am I going to give myself permission to be truly who I am? He made a commitment that no matter what type of obstacle shows up, he's going to show up. He said that we should be obsessed with our growth because if we're not growing, we're dying. He said that his biggest fear is being successful at the wrong things. He encouraged, encouraged us to figure out our magnet. That's the thing inside of us that pulls us towards other people or pulls other people towards us. Our magnet is what separates us from everyone else. What is our magnet? He says that that uniqueness that unique magnet is our greatest gift. He encouraged us to ask people, what is it about me that attracts other people to me? So many people told him when he started speaking that he had to change. He doesn't quite fit the traditional uh, commercial public speaker uh, norm. He has dreadlocks and he has tats and, and it wears a hat and doesn't wear a tie. And when he started his public speaking, many people told him he had to change, such as covering his tats or, or his dreads. And, and honestly, he did amazing. He didn't need to change anything. And at the beginning, nobody was booking him. And he said he could have cried about the opportunities that people weren't giving him, or he could have created his own opportunities. And that's what he did. He created his own opportunities to teach through his social media channels. He didn't wait to be dependent on other people to tell him, he was good enough or acceptable. He went and, and grabbed the bull by the horns himself. He, many people told him that he became an overnight success. But he explained that it really took him a decade to be an overnight success. He talked about the gardener mindset. His grandfather had a garden. And, and the speaker really wanted to grow some things. And, and so he went out with his grandfather and his grandfather helped him to plant those seeds. And, and then after, after about an hour, he went back to his, father, or his grandfather and he said, okay, we must have done something wrong because nothing's growing. I can't see anything. And his grandfather told him basically to just be patient and trust the process. And about four hours later, after he checked his plants again, he went back to his grandfather and said, grandfather, something's wrong. There's still no plants. And his grandfather told him, just be patient and trust the process. About two days later, he spoke to his grandmother and confided in her that he and his grandfather must have done something wrong because nothing was still growing from the garden. And she told him the same thing, to just be patient and trust the process. Sometime later, his grandfather called him and let him know that the harvest was ready. A lot of us have visions in our lives, but we don't have the patience to let the growth happen at its normal rate, then we try to force the process. We start something, we, we put in the work and we water the seeds, but we need to trust that growth is going on underneath the surface. He talked about how we can sometimes know that our vision is big enough when other people cannot see it. He told us that people become legendary because they make up their mind that they are not going to settle for anything less. Then they work to close the gap between their visions and their reality. Similar to what Anthony Truck told us yesterday. He goes to a cemetery each year, and I found this part very interesting and shared this one with my wife. He goes to a cemetery each year, and, and he said it's a little morbid, but he asks himself, what is it in my life that needs to die so that I can live? In order to be, to be connected with the right things that can push us and motivate us and inspire us, we need to unplug from the wrong things in our lives that, 
we need to pull the plug on the wrong thing, wrong thing so we can plug that cord into the right connections. I actually went back after the conference and asked my wife that question and, and uh, I worked to identify some things that, that I can kill in my life. Obviously not people killing we're talking about, but um, for example, I, I probably read too much on my favorite sports team's websites, right? And so that's something I can kill in my life right now in this season of my life so that I can focus more time and attention on the things that, that really matter. He says that he spends an hour every day connecting with the members of his community. He says that if you want to connect with others, you've got to humanize yourself. He talked a lot about creating transparent, excuse me, creating consistency. He says so many people are consistent at things that we hate. He went down into the audience and he pulled a member of the the crowd up and, and he asked him, um, you know, what's the worst job that, that he'd done? And the member in the audience said that he'd uh, worked uh, washing dishes at a restaurant and how he hated it when the, the cooks would just keep dumping dishes into the sink that he had to keep washing. And that man was consistent at going each day to work that he hated. He talked to that man from the audience also and asked him how he loved school and he said he hated it. Yet that man was still consistent at going to school. So the difference about being consistent or not isn't whether or not we love something because so many of us are consistent about doing something we hate. We don't have a consistency problem, he teaches us. He said we have a not understanding how important this is problem. We go to work because we have to do it to have a job, to provide for our family. Um, but when we look at these other things that are, are more important possibly than those things that we hate, um, it will help us to be more consistent at them. The next speaker was Krista Mayshore. And she talked about how to generate high quality leads that actually convert. Krista was super impressive. She built a company from zero to $19 million in revenue in just four years. One of her secrets of success is the funnel before the funnel. She was talking about pre-funnel digital domination. And she talked about how we need to attract, connect, and then convert. She went back to when she was 13 years old and told the story about how she was ab abused by her mother. And she ended up running away. She was arrested and she was sent to juvie. She went to rehab and then was sent to a foster home. She had a lot of challenges in her life and she said we all have something in our life that we have to deal with and we have to not use that something as our reason why we can't instead we have to use that as our reason why we can uh, later in her life her husband left her with two young girls and that's what forced her to create her business she she focused on her why and her why was to support her girls and keep them safe at her home. She became one of the top 1% of the realtors nationwide for more than 20 years. Just this year, she's earned three Two Comma Club awards, which means she had three separate funnels that earned over a million dollars each. Um, she also earned one Two Comma Club award, um, excuse me, one Two Comma Club X award, which means she had a funnel that earned more than $10 million. She taught us that 84% of people say that they've been convinced to use a service by watching a video first. She talked a lot about video marketing. She said that we need to get people to know, like, and trust us specifically through our video. She said that unless we're solving a problem, we aren't a solution. We have to know the problems of our avatars and then give them specifically video solutions. That helps us to scale our time. She talked about one study that was helping people give up sugar and alcohol. One group had coaching, accountability, and support, and the other did not. The group that did not have coaching, accountability, and support, um, at the end of the year, 90% of them would rather die than give up sugar and alcohol. While the group that had the coaching, the accountability, and support had a much, much higher success rate. So she encouraged us to get that coaching, accountability, and support we need to help us achieve the success 
we're seeking in our lives. She told us that we each have 60,000 to 70,000 thoughts every day. And she gave each of us this cool little bracelet and it has a little rubber band in it or um, a la piece of elastic in it. And every time that we have a negative thought, um, she taught us a, a, what's called a pattern interrupt to help us kind of break that cycle of the negative thoughts. And she, she taught us to stop, snap, and switch. So if we're having a negative thought, immediately snap the wristband to, to help us remember and, and do a pattern interrupt and then switch, replace that negative thought with a positive thought. She said that if she could go back in time and talk to the 13-year-old girl who didn't feel good enough or loved, she would tell her the same thing that she's telling us. We are, you are good enough. You were meant for more. Never stop. Figure it out. Make the time. Find the resources. If you continue to do what you have done, you'll get the same results you've always got. Um, we've, we have to change. We have to move forward. People never fail if they never stop. The next speaker was McCall Jones. And McCall was super impressive. She actually attended Funnel Hacking Live for the first time last year. And this year she was on stage. She also talked about leveraging the power of video. She taught us about shields and how shields keep us from losing. And she talked about weapons and how weapons help us to win. She said that the worst thing we can do in a business is look at a shield and call it a weapon. Once people, she talked about how the, we can pay and do a lot of marketing to get people to our videos, but once people press play, there's not much we can do to keep them watching our videos um, after, after they've started. Um, you can't pay them to keep watching your videos. So she created a weapon, it was called uh, Charisma, oh, I'm, I'm sure I'll get to it here in a second, I don't remember the URL, but she created a weapon that she's going to share with us. And she taught a lot about charisma. It's the ability to get people to pay attention to us, to trust us, and to act. And she talked about how charisma is a science. It's not just something we're born with, but it's definitely something we can learn and improve. So she did a lot of research, and she looked at the people with the top video fan score. She hacked them, and she learned from them, and she shared with us a lot of what she learned. She, she looked at a variety of different... Uh, criteria, there was the fan score where she measured how good the video influencer was. She looked at the authority style, how you get people to act. She talked about the compassion style, how you get people to trust. She talked about entertainment style, how you get people to pay attention to you. And she said that the top people are using effective charisma styles, much more than the ineffective people. And there isn't a right or a wrong charisma style. It's about finding our charisma style because there's many different charisma styles. Uh, and she said, if you get your charisma style wrong, it doesn't matter. They will never buy from you. They'll never trust you. So how do you get them right? Um, she talked about the authority charisma style, how you, you make people act. Um, and she talked about there's light where you where you're telling people to trust the process. And she says that Russell Brunson and his perfect domino framework are a great example of that. She talks about the lift style and that's telling people to trust themselves. And she talked about the lead style. And that's telling people to trust me. Um, if I can do it with them, you, um, I can do it with you as well. She then talked about compassion styles and that's how we get people to trust us. And they're steady people. Those are the people that are emotionally consistent. And then there's the people who try to fix. Um, they know exactly what I'm going through and they try to help me solve that. Then there's the people that mirror. They, they feel how I feel. She then talked about entertainment styles. And there's people who amaze, such as this is fascinating. Then there's excite. I am fascinated. Then there's the people who charm. Um, this is intriguing. Then there's the people who perform. 
I am intrigued. Then there's the people who impress. This is important. And then there's the people who roar. And those are the people who are basically saying, I am important. She taught us to avoid style traps um, that sabotage ourselves and how to stop those. One of those style traps she called Two-Face, and it's T-O-O face. She says that in our lives, people have told us something, we are too something, um, such as we're too intimidating or we're too aggressive or, or we're too bossy. And she told us that in her experience that those people who have told us we're too something are almost always wrong. I remember in high school, I was the sport and spirit commissioner. I was a student body officer in charge of putting on the spirit assemblies. And I remember people telling me I was uh, too passionate or too excited. And, and so I worked hard to be more calm and more, um, and, and I really became something I wasn't. And I think I actually lost something that was me. And so personally inside of me, this is one of the most meaningful takeaways um, for me for the day. Um, so I need to go back to maybe who I was and stop trying to be, uh, to change based on what people told me I was too much of. She said there are no good or bad styles. These are just tools. There are good and bad in every category. She said we should find people who have the same styles as us and model after those people. Uh, she said one of the most important places to model is at the end of the videos uh, where we look at their calls to action, but we can model everything they do. The next speaker was John Lee Dumas, and I love John Lee Dumas. He is the founder of Entrepreneurs on Fire, uh, the, the podcast that has more than 100 million total podcast downloads and more than 1 million downloads per month. And John's one of my heroes. Um, I've been on his show and, and he's been on my show. John talked about how we can create, grow, and monetize our podcast and platform the Funnel Hackers way. John talked about his early life and I'm not going to go into that. He also talked about his early entrepreneurial life um, because we covered that in much more depth in, in the show we, I already published um, in my interview with John. So I encourage you, if you're interested in knowing those details, to go back to the Monetization Nation episodes, or episode with John Lee Dumas. Uh, John then talked about why podcasting is so important. He talked about it being free, on demand, targeted. He talked it being, about it being our own platform. Instead of building our skyscraper on someone else's land, like I talked about, he talked about how important it is to, to build that on our own platform. Talked about how podcasts can be evergreen. Um, can be, they don't have to be. If you want to do a news podcast, that obviously won't be evergreen. But it can be content um, that can live for a very long time. He talked about the power of networking from podcasts, how he builds friendships with these incredible people. And, and I agree with that. I think podcasting is one of the best networking tools imaginable. He talks about, he talked about the incredible influence that he receives from having the show and working with these other influencers. He talked about how podcasting can help us hone our, our speaking skills. He said that 99.9% .9 of people are born terrible speakers and podcasting forces us to develop and improve that skill. He talked about podcasters paradise a little bit and if you've listened to the episode of his show that I did, um, you'll know that he's, he generated more than seven million dollars already from running that membership site and charging people $97 a month. He talked about when people start their podcast, what type of podcast they should create. And a lot of people, they try to just mimic somebody else's podcast. They see that Russell Brunson has been successful and they try to create a podcast like Russell Brunson. And he, he asked, do you want to be a pale, weak imitation of someone else? And obviously, it's going to be very hard to compete with someone like Russell Brunson. So we need to find our niche. We need to be the best us that we can be. He said that we are incredibly special and unique, and that uniqueness is how we're going to contribute to the world. He told us that we need to identify one big idea. Then we need to discover the underserved niche within that big idea. So this is similar, a similar pattern or 
or advice that we're getting from many people. Instead of starting with a product, you start with the audience and then you find the big problem of the audience and you create a product or service that, that solves the need of your audience. Start customer centric first. He talked about how people will beat a path to that number one solution. He talked about niching your face off, basically meaning go deep within your niche, right? Don't try to do a broad topic, but, but at least you have a chance if you go down deep within a niche. He talked about his niche being creating the best daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. And at the time he launched, there were a bunch of other uh, podcasts that interviewed entrepreneurs, but they were all weekly or, or every other week. And when he launched his daily show doing that, he was the best daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. He was also the worst and the only one doing it. Uh, and that's the power of niching. Then he talked about how we grow our podcast audience. And he talked about his acronym FOCUS. And I love that. He talks about that all the time. FOCUS for him means follow one course until success. And that's very meaningful. So often as entrepreneurs, we tend to try to do five different things at the same time and we divide ourselves and, and we are unsuccessful at all of them. And one of his secrets of success is following that one course until we're successful and then moving to the next one. He talked about working with podcast networks and, and how that helps him to, to grow his traffic and revenue. He talked about how important it is to convert the converted. In other words, he, he spends one day every month being on 20 other podcasts. He knows that, the, that every person listening to those other podcasts are podcast listeners. And the best way to find people who want to listen to his podcast or find people listening to other podcasts. He talked to us about the perfect podcast pitch. He gets more than 400 pitches every month and he obviously you know, can't even do 10% of those people as guests on his show. And he gave us a template that he uses when he requests to be a guest on other podcasts. And it was, it was frankly brilliant. Um, if I'm not going to cover that now just for the sake of time, but if you, if you want to know what that perfect podcast pitch is, go to Monetization Nation, shoot me an email through our contact form, and I would be very happy to send that to you. Um, he taught us how to find the experts, go into Apple Podcasts, go to the, the categories, and, and I, I guess I won't go through the details of that. He talked about how to monetize a podcast. Uh, he talked about sponsorship first and said, you know, that's, a lot of, that's the way that a lot of people want to monetize their podcast, but he crossed it off the list. He struck it out and he said that's really not a great option and most people can't make money with sponsors. You've got to have a lot of traffic to make money with sponsors. And it's really, really tough to make enough money from sponsorships to cover the cost of the show alone. You've got to really have a diversified revenue stream. So it's one revenue stream you can add, but it probably should not be one of your primary revenue streams. He said that the primary way should be selling your own product. We should ask our audience about their struggle. We should find the number one struggle of that audience and then create a product or service that solves that problem. Call that the funnel hacker way. Uh, he talked about how he personally funnel hacks with Entrepreneurs on Fire. He talked about how he has a free podcast course funnel pitch on, on many of his shows, if not all of his shows. So he takes them into that free podcast course. Uh, then he has an evergreen webinar uh, that he pushes them in as part of that course or at the end of that course that pitches them on Podcaster's Paradise. And Podcaster's Paradise is his $97 a month membership site. He encouraged us to use our platforms to promote us and not other people's products and services all the time. All right, moving on. The next speaker was Mike Sh Mike Schmidt and AJ Rivera. So they talked about what you need to do when your funnel isn't converting. And he talked about there's a small percent of people, maybe 4% of people that go to our funnel and are ready to buy. 
But there's another 96% of people who go to our funnel and leave and don't buy anything. So what do we do with them and, and why are those people leaving? Some people are leaving because they're just not interested. But maybe a huge percentage of those people are leaving because they're trying to learn more about us. They're looking for our reviews. They're looking for case studies about us. They're looking for more information. Let's see, I'm just going through my notes here. Um, he called this shadow traffic, and he talked about how people will search for us. They'll search for our company name, they'll search for our product name, they'll search for our name as, as the founder of the company. They'll add words to those searches like sucks or reviews or scams. Um, and, and these kind of searches are shadow traffic. And if we only have a funnel, we're losing, very likely losing that shadow traffic. So he encouraged us to build a funnel hub, a website that that can load quickly, can show up high in search engines, and can appear when people are looking for answers uh, such as those and doing searches such as those. So he talked about in order to improve conversions, two things must happen. We must eliminate skepticism and we must build trust. He talked about the trust tipping point. He said some people have higher and some people have lower trust tipping points. It, sometimes it takes more to help certain people overcome the skepticism they have. And we overcome those with the reviews and the credibility and the, the trust elements that we were talking about before. He talked about some other ways that they're going to look for us, like joining our list, joining our podcast, reading our blog, etc. They're trying to gather as much evidence about us as they can so they can make their decision or reach their verdict and, and close this case. And then he went through and discussed um, the Funnel Hub technology that they offer and, and what some of the features are in that. And, and it was very impressive. I highly recommend uh, that you look at that. The next guests that I had were Jason and Matt Harward. So Jason has earned more to Comma Club Awards than anyone else by far in the in the ClickFunnels uh, world. Jason has earned 19 Two Comma Club awards um, and Two Comma Club X awards that I didn't get that number down fast enough. He's earned more than $335 million in sales from his own offers. Uh, these gentlemen really know how to scale and repeat their business. Uh, I had Matt on my show recently and if you you want to learn more in depth about it, go look up the show that I posted for Matt Harward. Um, they talked about DTC, and DTC stands for direct to consumer. He said, he, he used a quote from Gary Vaynerchuk that was 98% of DTC companies are already dead. They just don't know it yet. He said that DTC is when you sell something to a consumer and you still own the relationship with that consumer. So if Johnson & Johnson sells something through Walmart or Amazon, that's not direct to consumer. If any of us sell through Amazon, that's not direct to consumer. He gave a quote from Neil Blumenthal, the CEO of Warby Parker. Quote, it's never been cheaper or easier to start a business, although I think it's never been harder to scale a business. Unquote. So they talked a lot about how to scale the business. Um, they talked about how they build it so that the customer has the relationship with the company, not with the CEO. It's a lot easier to sell the business um, and the CEO doesn't feel as tied to the business. They, talked, they shared some of the successes of their business. They've had nine consecutive years of 100% annual growth. They've had six eight-figure brands. Uh, they focus on building sellable, scalable uh, proven DTC businesses. So their single most asked question that they get from their customers that they use kind of as the, the focus of this presentation is, how do I find the products to sell? And they talked about how that's not the right question. Um, we really need to focus on who is our audience, not what is the product. If you're following people, okay, so so Matt is a race car driver, or Jason's a race car driver, excuse me. And, and he talked about if you follow someone on the racetrack who's, who's driving, you will never win. 
because you're always behind. And if you always follow him and he crashes, you're going to go into the wall as well. And they said that's particularly important because 98% of the DTC businesses are already out of business. They don't just know it. So if your focus in the DTC world is following someone else, you're 98% of the time probably going to be following them into the wall. He talked about a concept that they've developed called sandbox funnels. And they've used that to find proven two comic club products over and over again. So he had a series of rules, it was kind of witty how he did his rules. He started out with rule number two and he said sequence matters. And then he did rule number one, which is products don't. When he talked about sequence mattering, he said don't do things out of order, such as starting with a logo. He says if you have a business card and you don't have revenue yet, you're out of order. So they talked about what does matter. What, what matters is audiences first, algorithms, and how marketing today is controlled by algorithms. Trying, and they talked about how trying to game the algorithms doesn't work either. That is not a good strategy because you become dependent upon that gaming and then those algorithms change and they close the holes. Um, the platforms close the holes on those algorithm gaming that people are doing and, and the business goes out of business. So you've got to build it on solid foundations. He also said what matters is analytics. You've got to be a data-driven business. He talked about some of the product first challenges. So this is, this is what a lot of us do is we start out by building a product first and then we go try to find an audience to sell it to. And he said when we do that, that process is very slow. It's expensive, it's unproven, it's unreliable. It's kind of the lottery mentality. You buy a ticket and you hope you win. Uh, he says it's easily discovered by competitors. It's not algorithm friendly. He said it fatigues or goes stale easily and it has a much higher risk. They told the story of, of how uh, Jason had bought a whole bunch of ties with guns printed on them and he thought he was going to go sell them to, to some gun loving audiences. And um, he, he bought a ton of them and sold almost none of them. Wasted a whole bunch of money because he started product first. Then Matt told the story of a $65,000 neck surgery that he had. And he didn't want to buy a $65,000 neck surgery. He had a problem with his neck. And, it, and he went for a consultation with a doctor that he trusted. And he got a diagnosis. And the doctor prescribed the $65,000 neck surgery. But really, it didn't matter what the product was. It mattered what the result was. He wanted his neck fixed, and he got a prescription from somebody that, that he trusted. And, and so then uh, he bought the neck surgery because he trusted that was the solution uh, to the problem he was facing. Uh, the product doesn't matter. The results matter. He talks about how the traditional sales funnels that many of us build provide a, excuse me, provide a clear path from point A to point B. They're conversion oriented. They're high effort. They're designed to identify buyers and, and action takers. Then he talks about the sandbox funnel, this alternative model that they have. And they say that that provides a diverse surface area for machine learning algorithms. It's discovery oriented. It's low effort. It's designed to identify outliers and opportunities. So instead of starting with a product, we start with the audience. Um, and then they, they went through an example with the audience where they did it with a golf company and found people in the audience that were passionate about golfing. And, and they sold the, the people in the audience on their offer before they even told them what the product was. And, and they talked about that as the offer fulfillment mechanism. Some people call that a product. Could be a digital course, it could be gear, whatever. But you sell people on that outcome, that result. Um, and then you can try a whole bunch of different fulfillment mechanisms to help them achieve that result. The next speaker was Braven Grant. Braven talked about funnels versus carts. Braven was impressive. He's currently 23 years old. Um, he made multiple seven figures before the age of 22. He combined carts with funnels. As an entrepreneur, we have a gift and a curse that we are never satisfied, Braven told us. 
And the two strat he talked about in his presentation the two strategies that can simplify scaling our brands um, and make sure that there's profits to show for it. And he talked about how we can have both. We can have profits and we can have growth. He told a story of when he was a new entrepreneur and he, he hit the Two Comma Club Award where they reached a million dollars of revenue and he was so excited and celebrating and told his wife about it. She thought about it for a minute and then asked him, where is that money? And they weren't seeing it. They were only taking $2,000 a month uh, to provide for their family. They were living very meagerly and he was running a business, but it was not a profitable business. So he talked about how we can achieve that growth and be profitable. So he had tried a lot of the old school ways, conferences, influencer marketing, and he, he then taught us about strategy number one. And in that, he taught us we need to use a funnel to acquire customers for free or less than free. He said, he learned, when he learned about click funnels, he said, forget the cart, and they went in on, on funnels. But they only earned about $260 in that month. Uh, he was not earning enough money from funnels to make it worth it. He thought of every excuse. Maybe my product doesn't work with funnels. Maybe I'm too late to the online party. Maybe ClickFunnels is a scam. Maybe my market is just too saturated. Then he talked about uncertainty. And he said, you can't scale uncertainty. Certainty creates scalability. And I love this concept. Please get this. Certainty creates scalability. This is a value bomb. Remember this. So how do we create that certainty? He said, you have to understand your break-even numbers. You've got to focus on one channel for growth and then measure everything. In his case, he was running at a 3.7 ROAS, which means his, the revenue he was generating was 3.7 times what he was spending. The problem was when he finally got someone to help him figure it out, his break-even point was 4.5. Five. So that means even though he was getting a 3.7 ROAS, he was actually losing money. So because he had that data, he was able to go in and adjust the offer. He increased the value of what they were providing to their customers so he could then increase the price. His new break even was 1.7 ROAS. With, with the higher price, the ROAS dropped to a 2.1. They were more profitable. They had certainty. Right? They knew they were profitable and then they could scale. He talked about push button growth. And when we get to this number where we know we are profitable with our advertising, we can then scale the business. Within a short period of time, he had earned his first two Comma Club Award and they're working on number five. He said marketing math is the first step to going to the two Comma Club. He gave us a website. It was called breakevenordie.com. And it's a calculator that we can use uh, to, to break even on our numbers. He talked about if we, have, if we have a business that only has a front end funnel, maybe that business will make $10,000. But if we have a business with a back end funnel as well, that business can make $10 million. Um, there, there needs to be the front end funnel that acquires the customer and then the back end that provides the the bulk of our monetization. He talked about using a cart to build a machine to get customers to come back and buy more. He talked about how important it is to focus on helping them get from order number one to order number two. When you figure that out, then you help them get from order number two to order number three, all the way up to order number seven. He said that we bring most people through on original product, on their original product, which is a creatine product. And, and that may be just a break-even product that gets them into the funnel. That's their front-end offer. Then 30 days later, they offer another product. Uh, maybe it's a supplement. And they, they offer the supplement at a discount. And then they offer the renewal of the creatine. So they're selling two products. And then the next month, they add the third product and teach them about it and explain them about it, get, it, get them excited, until maybe they have seven different products that they're ordering each month over and over again. He said that the two questions we need to be asking ourselves to grow our business is how do we get more free customers into the machine? That's the front end funnel. And then how do we get more customers to come back and spend more? And that's the back end of the funnel. 
He encouraged us to use a funnel to acquire more customers for free or less than free, and then use the cart to build a machine that gets customers to come back and spend more. Okay, then Russell Brunson and Todd Dickerson came, and they talked about ClickFunnels 2.0, and this was um, the, the, one of the two uh, big teased presentations of the day. Uh, ClickFunnels 2.0 is the new version of ClickFunnels. They started from the ground up. This isn't just uh, improvement on the existing code base. This is something they've been working on for maybe a year and a half now. They, they told us that today is ClickFunnels' seven-year birthday. They went through a year and a half ago, or whenever they went through this process, and they mapped out the funnel hacker lifestyle, life cycle. And then ClickFunnels 2.0 was built to provide the technology, kind of an end-to-end -end solution for that, for that life cycle. They've added a whole bunch of things, and I'm just going to review a few of them here to help get you excited about ClickFunnels 2.0. Um, he talked about universal headers and footers. He talked about giving access to different team members by sections. He talked about how it's much faster. There's a new funnel, building flow, building a better flow chart. He talked about a team of people that can be editing it at the same time and attaching workflows to help each of the people to help people in each of the step of the process. He talked about an amazing new email editor and the funnel hub. He talked about universal sections that where you can make one edit and applies across everything. He talked about adding a blog and page templates, a customer center, um, and so many additional features. I, I'm just not going to be able to cover this with justice in the time that I have. And I've, I've got the, uh, someone here who is asking me to move. So uh, moving to the very last speaker, uh, that was Dan Kennedy. And that was a very sweet presentation. Dan Kennedy is the father of direct marketing. He's written more than 30 books. Uh, Russell Brunson is an expert on stage and is, uh, always looks like he knows what he's doing. And in the presentation with Dan Kennedy, Russell was nervous. He said, um, over and over again. And, and I would be the same way if I was interviewing Russell on stage because Russell's kind of my hero and, and marketing mentor. And, and that's what Dan was for Russell. Dan talked about how early in his career, um, he spoke with the owner of an ad agency about his ideal client um, and said that an ideal client was someone who basically had no idea what he was doing. And, and Dan said that he felt he could do something more honorable than that, like being a lawyer or a politician. He studied the masters of mail order and then he applied it to other industries like chiropractors. He had almost half of all the chiropractors of, in the country go through his marketing program. Uh, he says that the tools and tactics have changed a lot, um, but that really doesn't change anything. It's using the same foundational principles. For example, he talked about setting, setting up marketing with push instead of pull, and how Seth Godin um, has later called that permission marketing, made that famous today. He talked about how sh shovel sellers do better than shovel users. Um, he talked about how we need to match the message to the, the market. He said more than half of a scalable, sustainable success has to do with the audience we select. If we select it really well, then uh, mediocre marketing can get good results. But if we choose the wrong audience, then even exceptional advertising will probably still perform poorly. He talked about the importance of finding an underserved market and then um, creating a message to match it. He says we'll likely have a slam dunk. He told the story of a man who climbed over a fence and knocked on his glass door and told him that his shrubs were on fire. And before that man shared his message, he was really annoyed that someone had come over his fence with shards of glass on his fence and was looking through his window at him. Um, but once the man gave the message, you know, your shrubs are on fire, you call the fire department, I'll man the hose, um, that that man went from being an unwelcome pest to being a welcomed guest. He says it's all about delivering the right message at the right time. He said that as a marketer, he's doing everything to show up. Or he asked us, as a marketer, are we doing everything to show up as welcome guests? He said that whoever figures out how to spend the most uh, from their leads wins. That concept is something that Russell Brunson teaches over and over again. I bet he shared that at least three times in this conference. And that's really important. Getting to the spot that we can pay more than our customers for the leads. And if we can do that, we can buy scale and buy speed. 
and it was great hearing Dan talk about the concept. Dan also shared something really wise. He said, you can't afford to be renting your customers from Facebook or Instagram. You have to get your customer moved to your media platform. And uh, Dan gave some examples of that. Um, Dan, Dan talked about how wealth, freedom, and security come from what you own, not what other people own. He said that the most valuable asset you have and, and you shouldn't ever lose is you. And then the second most valuable asset is your customer relationships. He talked about when you need money, you can send an invoice to the herd. Basically, you, once you have a list that knows you, likes you, and trusts you, you can market to that list. He talked about how important it is to prevent leaks in our businesses. Um, he gave an example of typical chiropractic offices and how they would allow all of their staff to go to lunch together um, and send all the calls to the voicemail and how awful that was for the business. He says that if you can keep someone answering a call live, um, someone who is incented to care, the sales go up 20%. Um, so that is my, those are my key takeaways from Funnel Hacking Live today. And by the way, I've created a free ebook about passion marketing in which you can learn how to become a top priority of your ideal customers. You can download that for free at passionmarketing.com. You can also follow Monetization Nation on YouTube, our Facebook group, Twitter, Instagram, or on your favorite podcast pl platform. Thanks for joining me for this live stream. I wish you success in implementing these secrets and strategies as you work to grow your business.